pardon me. Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to take a brief look at a game I played a couple weeks ago. Um, I was kind of in a hurry that particular evening. I was kind of seeking to get a draw in the opening, just liquidating some pieces and such. Um, but we ended up playing a full game, and it was quite an exciting adventure. So without further ado, let's uh, take a look at the game. So I had opened with Queen Pawn, which is something I've been doing, I don't know, for a couple of years here. Um, I've played tons of openings from, or tons of King Pawn positions before that, and um, honestly there's just too much King Pawn theory for me to keep track of at the moment. Um, I think it was Fedorowicz at one of the Chicago Open tournaments just in a lecture that was free and open to the public, suggesting, you know, um, even if you're a tactical player, give d4 a chance. You'll find yourself um, having a lot of simpler positions and not having to memorize as much theory. So if you want to have good success and you don't have tons of time to memorize all the openings, give Queen Pawn openings a try and um, that's what I've been doing for at least a year now, I think. So, um, yeah, that's what I've been doing here. Um, recently, I believe, I'm forgetting how many months ago it was, but we saw that I had a tournament game against, was it a 1900 player? 2000? No, not 2000. Not, I think there were like 1850 or something. I'm probably misremembering this, but they had ended up playing uh, the Grunfeld against me. And it's just an opening I've tried to wield as the black pieces because I like tactical openings. I like just all the crazy mayhem that can result from every piece being under attack simultaneously and the possibility of liquidating to an endgame at any time um, because I'm pretty good at endgames. I've read quite a few endgame books probably read about 20 to 30 more in game books than your typical competitive chess player. So um, I think that if we do manage to liquidate into, liquidate into an endgame, well I just enjoy endgames. It's not like I'm trying to win in an endgame, it's that I actually find endgames pretty interesting. Um, so this opening gives the promise of being able to liquidate into an endgame. Um, without any provocation. Um, although that's not a reason to um, try to trade pieces immediately. Here we still have too many pieces on the board for this to be considered an endgame, obviously. Um, so typical moves in the Grunfeld... Um, well, c5 is fine. But at some point black does want to castle and probably wants to play knight uh, to c6. So I played a move ordering that I've been doing lately. Um, I'm not a great expert on this as the white pieces. Uh, I just that particular knight wanted to try to see if I could trade off everything on d4 and also avoid this um, bishop to g4 pin idea that would result from knight f3. So, here I was just trying to find a way to um, exchange as many things on d4 as possible. And also, um, well, not have like four pawn islands or something. Like, if I had... Well, this is perfectly fine. I'm discussing all kinds of hypotheticals which don't make any sense here. Um, but I don't think Rick C1's most popular here. Uh, do we have this? This is looking at the Masters database. Rook c1 is second most popular. Queen d2 is the main move. Uh, is c5 the main move? It is. Okay. I'm pretty confused because I'm looking at this from a perspective. I usually look at this from the black side. So I'm looking at this reversed compared to how I typically look at it. Which is really confusing me. But Rook c1 
like in Queen Paw, like in uh, Queen's Gambit, except in Queen's Gambit Declined and all that. Rook C1 makes sense here as well. Um, and um, so yeah, this denies Black the ability to play Bishop G4. I have to confess, I'm not so familiar with Queen D2. Although, it seems to make some sense. I think my friend, one of the spectators, had, after the game, suggested this stuff. Um, yeah, Rook B1 is stuff I used to play a lot. Um, well, <laughs> a lot is kind of subjective when you only have like half a dozen games in the Grinfeld as white at, at all. Um, yeah, in Blitz, I played Rook B1. Here, I kind of like Rook C1 because I've done so many games in Blitz and I know this B7 pawn is not the target that everybody wants it to be. Um, so, yeah, this is just a way for White to develop. Um, I had kind of anticipated something kind of like this happening, um, where pieces just get exchanged. I have one pawn island on the king's side plus d4, and another pawn island on a2, which is not easy for black to attack. Black also has two pawn islands. With any luck, I'll be able to develop all my pieces and quickly exchange down into a drawn endgame and get on with that evening. Um, but that's not the way that went. Um, also possible is castles. Uh, Queen d2 has avoided a bishop g4 pin. White still does need to castle at some point, so this makes some sense, too. Right. Um, I guess White intentionally delays development of this bishop until White knows where to put it. Um, oh, this is actually... Yeah, this is the popular main line. This is the crazy stuff that I can't be bothered to memorize. Um, but it makes sense to play it. It's just... This is the stuff I've tried to prepare from the black side, where you play c5 and queen a5 and rook d8 and all this goodness and joy, where you don't get the chance to play bishop g4 because it's not a pin. Um, so queen d2 is one sub-variation. Queen a5 is actually the main move here. Um, I think it was, uh, again, my spectator friend after the game commenting that this was like a lay line between Kasparov and Kramnik or something. Here's Kramnik, Kramnik playing black, here's Karyakin, here's Kramnik again. So like this stuff, this is stuff that they play that i I looked at more master games, I'd be more familiar with what's going on. Um, but in any event, the worst that can come for white is just liquidating into an endgame that we've seen before. Oh, in fact, we've transposed to the castle line that we were just looking at. Um, where I was saying, um, well, hang on, what's different? White's not played knight f3. Um, uh, what were my opinions during the game on what was going on? Since we're not going to be studying opening theory all day here, I should look at more master games. I'll have to make a note to do that. Um, but yeah, I was just attempting to liquidate. Um, we've already traded a pair of knights. We've traded our queens. This can be considered an early end game, even though white's king is somewhat exposed. Um, Black had banked on the fact that he's got pressure on this d4 pawn. But... Uh, White has this monumental space advantage here and is gaining a tempo on this bishop. So um, Black is forced to react somehow and knight c6 isn't good. Well, uh, knight c6 is interesting. I thought I had something planned for it. And I don't think it was pushing d5. Um... I mean, this felt very uncomfortable. I don't think that I was going to push d5, but what if I did? Uh, knight b4 is the interesting try, because like, if you play knight to d4, the knight's basically trapped here. Um, it's very uncomfortable for black. 
right? Like, isn't there some tactical resource that I thought I saw during the game or something? Or am I just making that up? Uh, plus 1.2, rook c4, oh, right, right. Um, I know you don't, you aren't going to believe me, but my opinion is that this knight was trapped. This discovery is scary. Um, there's just a lot of things which can happen in this position. Um, the simplest of which is we sack we exchange our rook for two minor pieces and still have to worry about developing our remaining pieces but so does black um, that's one thing that could occur another thing is just that look at this knight it's uh, yeah black does want to, like I can't play knight e2 basically black does want to liquidate stuff um, now that white's played a pawn weakness uh, his pawns are no longer flexible White would need to play e5 for these to be strong again, and White can't afford to do that at present. Um, no, I think I probably would have opted for f4 here, honestly. Um, engines are going to have their preferences, but this knight feels very loose. Um, and yeah, this is just super uncomfortable for... Um, yeah, let's promote this up a level. Um, I mean, yeah, rook c4 is a possibility, but f4, and this is just, like, super loose. Um, there's no need to go into that endgame with the tactical nonsense um, with rook c4 and rook takes c8 and then bishop takes b5. That endgame could be better, but... Uh, it feels like a lot of things get liquidated there. Hey, welcome. What's up? So just looking at a recent over-the-board game. Uh, played, I guess, a couple weeks ago. Uh, castle. Here we develop. Oh. Yes, my opinion was that I was well-positioned here. Um, just I have a nice central dominance which is difficult for black to break up because black doesn't have any useful pawn um, levers against my center. If black plays f5, I might have f3. If they play e5, I obviously have d5. So um, there's really not a whole lot for white to be concerned about in this position. And d5 is like, if I have to, I can play it. But I probably want to for late end game. But for the middle game, having the pawn on d5 is kind of overextended a little bit, maybe. I don't know. Regardless, black just doesn't have a good pawn lever, so white dominates the center. And that central dominance makes it very difficult for black to activate his pieces. So I was very happy with this opening position. Um... So here, my big idea, well, was what happened in the game. I developed my bishop first, and then my knight, and I just have more space. And this is great for white, in my opinion. Black plays the obvious developing move, hitting my d-pawn, and the only thing I had to worry about is, like, do I play king c3, uh, intending rook h to d1? Um, do I play king d... well, okay, point... We cannot play king d3 here, or at least doing so is risky because we're trading stuff. Um, and the more pieces we trade, the less our space advantage, less good our space advantage is. This, so this is not really um, something meriting consideration. Um, but this might work. Um, it's spooky because black uh, can in a hurry, develop um, the rook to c8. So, um, this looked like kind of a scary thing. All this is pretty loose. I think this does follow a master game, if I remember right. Um, although I probably remember incorrectly. And I'm not sure what's going on. 
White would like to bring his king to safety somehow. Um, I'm not sure if king d2 is tactically justified. Uh, our silicon friend seems to like king d2 as well as king b2. Yeah, so that's something to ponder. Did I miss any tactics here? I wonder. So king c3. Um, rook b8. That's interesting. I don't care what the end evaluations here say, but rook b8 was pretty interesting on its own right, because like, you know, it threatens to push b5 and b4 quickly, and who knows what results there. It's very unusual. Um, yeah, bishop d7, like I was saying. And I was thinking rook hd1 was the, a reasonable way to approach this. Fine. Oh, I see. So we're going to gain a tempo with knight a5. Ah, clever. Um, so then rook c8 comes with check. So this is very unfortunate. <laughs> Um, so that's all to say, like, I felt pretty uneasy about king c3, so I just played bishop d5 instead. Um, what does our friend think about bishop d5? Uh, it's okay. It's not losing. So I haven't missed some major tactic here. e6. I am not a fan of e6. Um, this, like, you don't want to do this as black. You don't want to do this as black, creating all these holes on your king side. Yes, they complement your bishop, but your bishop can't cover all of these holes simultaneously. I mean, yeah, the knight covers e7, but it's just one piece and not for long. Um, I was proud of this at the time. I'm not so proud of it anymore. Um, this certainly complicates the position and slows down black from playing c5. Um, and bearing in mind if black pushes e5, this kind of makes d5 possible. Um, what is our silken front thing? Is rook c5 okay? Not even top three. Not even. Oh, come on. I thought it was clever. Rook hd1 makes sense. I just, I felt that was too equal. And I thought I had something here. Obviously not. Honestly, e5 is just the way to go. Weird. Oh, okay. Wait, hey, hang on. It's it's backpedaling from its big evaluation. Yeah, during the game I was thinking bishop f8 was the way to go here. And that I just have to pull back. And, like, I thought this bishop was better placed on g7, so I was willing to go into this. Even though black could gain another tempo with bishop a6, I wasn't afraid of it. Um, this is complicated stuff. Yeah, I was most afraid of c5, honestly. Um, but I thought white was doing great here because I develop all my pieces, and black's bishop isn't on g7. Um, I see it suggesting f5, but that doesn't seem serious, does it? Computers aren't necessarily great at this kind of position where it liquidates into an endgame and you need to find all the pawn weaknesses. Um, there's just too many weaknesses or potential weaknesses for both sides for the engine to prioritize here. A5 does gain space. A5 makes some sense there. F5, EF5, EF5. I think white's not worse there. White's uncomfortable for sure. Black has the bishop here, but... Hmm. Yeah, I guess a5 and f5 are both serious contenders here. I like a5 because it gains space and allows black to delay decisions about his pawn structure. Um... It all comes down to, is a5 tactically justified if white tries something dicey? And the answer is probably yes. Oh, I see. So if I try something like king c3 after a5, my rook gets trapped. 
if I try some other king move to try to hold my center together, that just makes the center more of a target. Unless I do king e1. But if I'm doing king e1, yeah, black is gaining tempi anyway. So this would have been a reasonable way for black to proceed. Um, oh, I see. So it's recommending bishop g5, perhaps with the like aim of playing king e3. Hmm. I know it's suggesting rook b5, but I don't like this. Rook b5 is, at worst, uh, white's sacrificing in exchange for a pawn. Um, I'm sorry, at best. At worst, it's possibly losing more material. Um, so that's all to say, if bishop f8, rook c4 dropping back isn't as great as I initially thought it was. And I'm not sure what else I have here. Like, can I do rook a5? No, obviously not. Could I do rook c6, I think is what I was going to play here. Uh, let's promote that up a line, because I think that's what I would have settled on, even though it's not so exciting. It is an endgame. We know all rook endgames are drawn. Um, so this is something like this is what I was considering, truly. Uh, and in other lines, I'm giving up my g-pawn. Not here, but later on in the game. Um, and I figured, you know, I could probably hold this and quickly agree to a draw and just finish. Um, so rook c5 I thought was a way to try to play for a win. Obviously, just developing my remaining piece would be a lot saner. Uh, but I thought rook c5 was just dominant. And Black kind of agreed with me that, um, yeah, your position's just much better here, so I'm going to play this really passive move. Um, which, yeah, Stockfish, I guess it still prefers Black slightly, but I like my position. I like my odds here. Because the worst that's going to happen is that we're going to liquidate into an endgame, and I know endgames backward and forward, so I'll manage to either draw or drag out for tons and tons of moves, a position that nobody wants to play. I have successfully played king e1, so that completes my development. Um, black triples on the d4 square, and I start a counterattack because I realize black's not going to trade their rook for a pawn. Um, they might do bishop takes, but if I do knight takes, rook takes, bishop takes. Um, the black does get the last capture, but uh, is giving an exchange to win a pawn, which might still be their best try here, because bishop a8's no fun. Because um, look at this. Black doesn't seem to so much mind um, imprisoning their bishop. Um, and I was extremely skeptical about this c5 push. Um, so... Let me see. Um, I figured at worst I had this bailout variation. Uh, actually, more than one, I guess, but this variation where I still control the center. And okay, black has the bishop pair, but this is not so excellent for black. Um, black might still be somewhat preferable here, honestly. Um, but d4 is just a monster, and I control so many holes on my opponent's side of the board that uh, unless they can manage to pile up all their pieces against my d-pawn, uh, this is okay. So the challenge here would be for black to transfer their bishop over to b6 and be able to hit this, or to find some other way to like try to liquidate the bishops and then trade off pieces in a way that wins the d-pawn. But white has tons of piece activity in the meantime, because white controls both files. Um, and this knight can jump anywhere, especially to d6. So, um, yeah, this knight, this is a position where it's kind of fun to have the knight. Um, but this is my fallback variation for trying to bail out of the position. Um, I thought this was actually better because um, 
here now I'm starting to like I have a space advantage I'm not immediately liquidating material but now I'm breaking up blacks um, threats on the D file and perhaps even getting a passed pawn on my own um, black did play rook e8 but had they played rook c8 I think I was planning to play rook c5 here I think and the point is that either black moves away with the rook or exchanges um, oh hang on well this kind of spoils the fun that we see later in the game um, so yeah I guess we'll save that for another time um, just say black has to move the rook away and white's won the pawn with tempo uh, so black does move away um, and then so I have obvious ways to collect material and or bolster my center like I consider f4 um, I could consider just trying to be greedy materialistic um, and like take on c5 anyway even though it doesn't win a tempo um, I could I had even considered um, just playing f3 um, and seeing you know maybe if I give away the material maybe I could still hold this um, it's not so great though so I'd considered this for some time and ultimately came up with um, this cute little move so you see there's holes here um, I mean yeah g2 is hanging but I don't care uh, so I control e7 d8 um, yeah my center is collapsing but I'm getting all kinds of fun piece activity I've got both my rooks doubled on the b file um, and my knight is poised well it could take any route here um, I have now I've only moved it once so um, yeah, there's quite a few ways this knight could move that would surprise my opponent. Um, so they play bishop c6, um, which puts the question to the rook for sure. Um, honestly, like, this was not necessary. Uh, well, I'm sorry, no, this is attempting to defend e8. It's just tactically this doesn't quite work out. Um because I play rook b8 anyway, as I did in the game. So here we're met with the harsh reality that, um, like, save black just liquidates, right? Well, you can't exactly play rook d8 here. There's nowhere for the king to move, so you'd have to play bishop f8. But then, um, this is pinned to win, uh, 101. So, yeah, that doesn't quite work for black, right? Um okay so how does black improve upon this is the big question you can't just leave the rook hanging um, um you i think during the game rook f8 i think was what black had to do um but it's not still not so comfortable um so we pin this again um, and I think black has to just sacrifice material to survive um, something like this uh, and the point of course is that um, now they can play rook f7 I think this was forced at least I think this is what I came up with during the game it's been a while I let's see Bishop h6, even so. Okay. Yeah, I favored my position here. I didn't look at this too deeply. Um, but apparently this is still good for white. Um, oh, so black is temporarily bottled up, so you could threaten, like, taking on e6, right? Is that the big idea? Yeah, so we take do this. Um, oh my goodness. Wait, why is black not trying to hold the e-pawn? 
oh wow <laughs> this this supernatural idea here this natural idea rather um is beautiful i admit i missed that during the game that would have been an excellent way to end the game okay so that means bishop d5 the most natural way to try to hold this falls apart what about a less natural way to try to hold this do i have d5 anyway holy crap this is cool wow <laughs> okay i admit i didn't see that during the game uh and i mean the key point to all this is like say black just gets stupid for a second um now i'm just winning f8 so um okay uh i'm not sure what i would have done here i'm not sure i would have found bishop h6 like i was looking at bishop takes f6 i was looking at pawn takes f6 um and this is all considering if black finds rook f8 to begin with now what does stockfish think about just my calculation skill in general yeah it does like rook takes f8 uh does not like any other move uh bishop takes much prefers over anything else rook b8 is that the only good try here I mean, I would have played it because, um, wait, king g7. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I was looking king g7 during the game. That was it. And I came up with bishop f6, um, and black is faced with an unfortunate choice here. Uh, well, no, he's not. This is the only move to save the bishop. And I preferred this for white, after the simple pawn takes pawn. I mean, you don't even need to calculate this at this point. Um, black is just very tied down. And if white's knight lands anywhere near black's king, this is over. And black has no way to repel the rook. So, I didn't need to calculate any further than that to see, like, hey, this looks fun. Let's try it. <laughs> what you're supposed to do during an actual chess game, like, um, is calculate stuff and not just wing it. But winging it can lead to a lot of fun positions. Um, so we gotta promote king g7 because that is the best try. f6 is an inferior try due to bishop h6 being just godly here. Um, that's amazing. So uh, that's all to say that during the game I was looking at rook f8 and bishop takes and king g7. Um, and I thought that was Black's best try. Um, Stockfish suggests Rick F8, um, but it's it does not speak too harshly about Rick to D5. Um, but this leads us into our game continuation, right? Where I exchange here and then I pin this bishop, which looks okay for Black. It looks like I have a dark squared bishop, they have a light squared bishop, so you would think that king f8 would hold everything together, but no, I have this bishop c1 move. And suddenly, I mean, the key point is like, if black tries to take the center apart, um, that sucks. <laughs> Black's just like one move away from being able to do bishop takes e5. And uh, yeah that one tempo is decisive. So uh, black has to play something like king e7 here. Um, is that best? Yeah, apparently black doesn't have anything better. And bishop a3 is my best move here, right? Yeah, I mean, oh, bishop g5 is playable too. What's the point? Doesn't that just transpose? Yeah, it does. So. Bishop g5 transposes back into this bishop a3 line with best play. And check it out, like, I've got d4 defended. Um, my pawns just dominate the center. Uh, black has successfully developed, kind of, whatever. Um, I'd actually expected... well, I'm not sure. I was thinking they'd move their bishop somewhere. Bishop d7, bishop c5 just wins on the spot, so not that, but 
I was thinking of something like F6 here, just a desperate ploy to get active somehow and try to break up this pawn center. Is F6 reasonable? King D7's best. What? How is that so? How is like Bishop C8 not, or C6 not that good? What's wrong with this? Bishop C5. Rook takes. Why rook takes? I'm not coming to terms with this very well here. Um, well, okay, rook takes allows you to dissolve the center. That makes some sense. But king d7, f4. Oh, I've trapped the rook, is the point. Oh. Huh. <laughs> so f4. And this rook is trapped, so black is going to exchange on c5. Um, and if black tries to worm his way out, we have a tempo move. Um, and if we try to continue struggling, um, white just wins a pawn. Okay. That's interesting. I have to admit, I didn't see all of that, but like, once I got this far with bishop a3, um, yeah, white is just clearly much better here. Not necessarily winning, but we'll say white white is better. We'll annotate that. Uh, so yeah, I just take... I'm not sure that the rest of the game is of much consequence. Um, wait, do I have something better than taking c5? I'd underestimated bishop takes e5, I admit but I still think that this was best. Yeah, so bishop takes is fine. Um, for the move played in the game, because this is threatening a7 with check and tempo and stuff, but also... Oh, I forget all the things I was calculating here. Um, Black does want to get their king's side rolling if they want to exchange everything and have a chance of drawing this. Um, what was it here, though? Oh, their rook. Black's rook is, um, yeah, what I was planning here was knight c3 hitting the rook, but also then knight b5 and knight a7. Or, I don't know, my knight is just, like, active on c3. It doesn't have to go to a7, but, um... My big idea was that I was going to put my knight on c3, play h3, play f3, play g4, something like this, where this bishop can't be too effective. Where also, um, his king is stuck guarding this bishop, right? Because I've got this pressure here. Um, it's kind of, I've kind of shackled this king um, to the defense of the bishop. Um, and the king has no way to move. So my big idea was that if this bishop moves away, I can hop around with my knight and cause mayhem. This is, like, impossible for any black player, any untitled player here, um, to play the black pieces and calculate it all correctly. So this was not one of the engine's top three options. Um, I admit I got a bit lazy here. Um which probably made the game drag on longer than necessary. Knight c3 still is an obvious candidate. Is there something better? Um, I know it's very alluring to just say that the engine evaluations are correct, especially because that's confirmation bias, um, which allows me to say that all my ideas are the best, uh, which is probably not true. But yeah, knight c3 seems necessary to develop my knight to an active square, so let's say it's okay. Uh, rook h5. This is kind of baiting white into playing knight to e4 and knight f6, which looks like at first as if it works. Um, I spent a lot of time calculating this stuff and couldn't find a way to make that work. Um, so I instead opted for knight b5. But, what was I calculating here? I think it was specifically, um, how is it that, oh, rook 
f5 here. And that if I try to do something greedy like g4, they have rook f4. And there's just not a way for white to break through this so easily. It looks like this should be the easiest thing in the world, but um, surely I missed some tactical nuance here somewhere. Um, so what was it that happens after knight e4? Yeah, rook f5, I saw that. King e2, h4, h, uh, bishop e3, a3. Uh, can the engine make up its move as to what white's supposed to play? Because it's saying bishop a3, rook a5, and then bishop up to f8, which has me very confused. You're activating black's rook. I just don't get it. Unless we're saying that having the rook on a5 is less threatening than it is on f5. But how is that? The, oh, right. Okay. But why bishop a3 then? Why that square? What's white? Oh, knight to c5. Okay. Good god, that's like super difficult to find. So the point, bishop a3 is superior to bishop b4 because bishop b4 similar moves run into this. You don't want to do that. Bishop a3, if black tries to win a tempo, um, black's not winning a tempo, and white still has many threats in this position. The most obvious of which is knight to c5 hitting the king, losing black's bishop on e8 here. Um, and I think white's just winning a bishop due to this dual threat of knight c5 and knight to f6. And that's all well and good, but what had me confused about all this is I didn't find bishop a3. Um, I had even considered bishop f8, um, but that doesn't quite cut it here. Like, and the bishop a3 position, supposing, um, what was it? White's major threat in this position is knight c5, right? Um... Somehow knight c5 is just much better in this position. Um, probably because there's discovered checks that abound everywhere here. Does rook a5 black's only try, like... Yeah, what if black tries to stop this check? Oh, we just do it anyway. Okay. Um, there's, I think, in lines where I'm playing bishop f8 instead. Just none of the tactics worked out here. Um, so if we check, he's got king c7. And I couldn't find a way to break this little mini fortress thing during the game. And I just felt like all my pieces were starting to get really loose. But comparably, um, Let's say we don't play bishop b6. Let's say we play a comparable bishop d8 here. Um, yeah, this bishop actually participates in the attack. So we're threatening this. We still have this pin on the back rank. The king obviously can't move still. And if black tries to gain a tempo on our rook, we check here and then just take on d8. Um, this would have been an amazing way to end it. Um, so bishop h4, I assume I just kick it. Yeah. Um, oh! <laughs> wow! Okay, bishop b5 is a candidate move here, according to the engine. Um, oh my goodness. If bishop b5 is your top move, this is a painful position to play. Uh, it's suggesting bishop f6 which I think is our only way to try to hold the bishop. Oh, I'm sorry, the other bishop's under fire. Never mind. Um, so why g3? Oh, g3 just yeah puts the final nail in the coffin due to the double attack on h4 and e8. I forgot e8 was hanging. 
so yeah, bishop a3 would have been brilliant. Um, I missed it. So we just have to settle for a mediocre um, what actually happened in the game. Where we both calculated lots of stuff. I miscalculated some things. I'm not too proud of it. I'm actually kind of... I don't know. We'll say not proud. I'm pretty proud of the rest of the game. Maybe I shouldn't be because it's, most of it's above my level. Um, in terms of the just awesome tactics that resulted. Um, Black did correctly spot that this is not so easy for white. And that's a difficult... This is... Um, a time control of 45 moves in 90 minutes. Black did find this king d8 move at the last possible um, move of the time control. I think he spent his remaining minute and in the last few seconds shifted his king over to d8, uh, which is correct. Um, note that if Black like plays king here. Um, I'm pretty sure this is just much better for white. Um, because white's knight takes on this pawn over here, and white's king diverts to the queen side. Which is not your first reflex in this position. You would think that the white knight would take on the queen side. But no, the kings are going to box each other out. White's king is ultimately going to capture this a pawn or delay it while the knight just munches everything on the king's side. And black's king is much too slow. Um, is my assessment, am I completely full of it? Is this position much harder than I thought it was? I mean, yeah, I knew like this would pose some challenges, but I was extremely confident that white was better. I'm still confident that white's better here. Um, what's with these suggestions? Knight c1, king b5, king d4, king b4, my king's boxed out. Huh. I mean, obviously white's not losing any of this, which was the other consideration I had, is that, like, I could play this and not worry. Um, so can't, top engine move is knight d4. But what gives? Like, white's king boxes out black's king. And if white's in the square of the pawn, everything's hunky-dory. Um, and yeah, I saw some stuff like this during the game too, where the knight drops back to a1 if absolutely necessary, and white could hold a fortress, and that's not hard either. But, wait. Is this really the best white has? What gives? And the other thing is, I don't have to go into this work end game. Uh, although I thought it was best. I was pretty certain. Um, I do still have this other variation I could look at, which is just chomping both pawns, f7 and a7. Um, regardless how black captures this, white's position is preferable, but this is not winning. Um, but white still has some chances to push here. But, um, yeah, no, that doesn't cut it. So, this thing about king d8 being the correct move might have been um, just a complete error in judgment on my part. Um, yeah, so does king c6 draw? If king c6 draws, then this whole endgame that I built up to in the game is just completely wrong. Um, so, king b6. I admit I didn't fully calculate this during the game, because, again, I was trying to finish the game quickly. 
Uh, King F3, there can't be any worse than King F1. If King F1 is the winning move, then chess is just too hard for all of us. Um, I do want to play my king to the center. Um, although Stockfish is no longer recommending King E4 and is suggesting everything else. Which says to me that maybe this is just dynamically equal. That the best white can do is a fortress draw. Um, note that if you get the knight on c1 and black's king and pawn race up the board, the best that's going to result there is a perpetual chase of your the king chasing your knight. Um, there's no such thing as a table base for that, but just if you read your endgame books, your literature, you'll realize you'll recognize this king and knight and pawn, um, and how it's able to just dance around in a square while the king chases it forever and how it has to keep dancing or the pawn promotes. Um, and if there's a square on this circuit where um, your king can defend the knight, maybe um, maybe that doesn't draw. But um, yeah, I mean, white needs to transfer their king to the queen side to snatch the pawn and needs this knight to cause mayhem on the king's side, or there's just not going to be a win. Um, I'm thinking there's probably not a win here. Which is crazy. I... yeah, I know you need the king to stop the pawn, you need the knight to cause the mayhem. Wait, what's king d5? Is black seriously in time there? Also, how does king b4 not cut it? What's so bad about king b4? Oh, white makes a fortress and drives away the black king? I don't believe this. Okay, Stockfish is changing its evaluation. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, here white is just too slow. Black's king does successfully munch the pawn. Um, and white has not stirred up enough mayhem. Which is all to say that this knight c1 idea is not something that I would have played. Um, so we've looked at king e4. I still think that that's best-ish, maybe. Maybe king e3, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. a4, because I want this knight on the king's side, but I also need my king in the square of the pawn. That's the dilemma here. Um, so there are two things white needs to pursue, both with utmost urgency. Um, whoops, that's, that's a mouse slip. There's no reason for black to prefer that when they have king c5, which provides access to all the same squares. So white's in the square of the pawn and is threatening this stuff. So black needs to reduce the size of the square of the pawn. Um, wait. Wait, 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 what? Oh. Okay, white's not in time there. So, okay, I miscalculated this. Wow, holy moly. I was super proud of this endgame. Wow, okay, well that's a bucket of cold water in the face to just know that, like, this whole endgame I pursued, it's just not working at all. Which is to say, if I keep going back moves, uh, I need to find where it was that I messed this up. Um... So, is my knight d6 thing, trapping their bishop, not sufficient? Do I need a better endgame? I mean, yeah, during the game I briefly looked at this. Um, I didn't think it led anywhere. 
I'm so confused. So let's take a look at this variation, although I think it comes to the same thing, doesn't it? Oh, but white's got a crucial g4 move in here. Um, okay, and the point of this king e8 is to avoid knight f6 escaping. Um, and we need to stop pawn to g5, so that makes some sense. Uh, the fact that this is just plus one in a bit suggests that like white's not actually winning this. If there were a forced win, this would change to something much larger. So g4 is not the solution. Um, so I have to back up further. So yeah, my whole knight b5 idea uh, is flawed, and bishop b6 reduces it to smithereens. Wow. Okay. Which in turn means I needed to calculate all this other fun stuff that I didn't do during the game. I mean, I tried. I was just not... Um, it was a weekday. Like, if this were a weekend event, you can bet that I would have calculated all this um, better than I did. I would go so far as to say that I'd actually find uh, the material win here, but maybe that's a bit too far. Um, but yeah, certainly knight e4 makes sense. Even if you don't find anything beyond knight e4, king f5, and then king e2 like the engine's suggesting. I mean, this is still excellent for white. Black is just completely tied down. Um, I mean, I did see this during the game. I just thought that my knight b5 idea was also winning. So why go for the super complicated stuff when there's a much easier way to win this position? Uh, the point of this king move, by the way, instead of just taking an a7... What was it? I saw during the game that just taking an a7 didn't look so great, but I forget why. What was it? Oh, yeah, black's king just gets super active, and their bishop gets active, and suddenly their bishop pair kind of compensates for this mess. Um, I didn't at all want to go here, especially with my king, like, super prone in the center, and the king not participating in this center fight. So you don't want to play rook takes a7 straight away. The material's just not worth it. Um, king e2, on the other hand, makes a great deal of sense where you're actually starting to get your king toward the center to combat the rook and like just keep black tied down. Uh, this does allow black to preserve the pawn, and I think that's ultimately why I rejected this variation, just because it seemed like too much of a hassle to go hunting down the pawn, even though black has no way to hold it forever. Like, white can always just bring their knight over to take this, um, and black is forever like tied down due to this and that. So um, yeah, even though this is like a super pleasant position for white. Um, let's see. Yeah, I know the engine's recommending both bishop f8 and bishop a3, both of which occurred to me. Well, bishop f8 occurred to me. Bishop a3, not so much. In this position, it kind of did, because the pawn was on a5, so rook a5 is not possible anymore. Um, but yeah, I was looking at ways to try to shuffle my pieces around. I didn't find a forced win here. Um, this still feels right somehow. And the point is that if they do bishop d8, Again, we have uh, this stuff. Wait, knight d6. Um, wait, why not knight c5? Oh, uh, I guess here we're not winning material, because there's no bishop to b4, bishop a5 stuff. Um, so here you need this fork. Oh, f7 drops. But why not bishop c7? 
Oh, bishops. Right. No, I saw this during the game. Um, in a different variation. Um, okay, so that just drops the bishop straight away. So we're just going to make the main line. Black attempts to resist and um, is overworked. I'd seen this in a different variation, um, but the theme recurs here where he's just not able to hold everything. He does get some activity, but it's not nearly enough because, well, okay, even if you don't have rook e7, even if somehow rook a4 is actually a thing, uh, white can drop back with rook c3. But yeah, rook e7 is just decisive instantly, so no need to go any further here. So that's all to say, like, my bishop b5 move is a, or knight b5 is a mistake, and bishop b6 um, does fight back quite strongly against my move. Now, what was the other thing I was looking at here? Like, I was considering taking on b6 or taking on a7. Um... I think I might be thinking of a different variation. In any event, uh, yeah, my knight b5 just completely blows it. And I needed to find this knight e4 move to have um, a win. Knight b5 did end up being enough in the actual game to win it. But it caused a lot of headache and heartache and such. So, uh, yeah, finding this would have simplified um, the game for both of us. Um, I did manage to outplay my opponent, but I shouldn't be too proud of that. I really should have found this move. Um, so, let's back up a bit. I was really proud of bishop c1. It's a really clever move that I rarely get to play something like. And it just points out um, that my rook a to b5 leading up to bishop c1 uh, looks sound. We've not blunder-checked this with the engine, but I'm pretty sure rook a b5 is the way to go, right? Or is there more than one solution here? Am I, again, full of it? Um, for sure I saw that rook a b5 is like the way to activate all my pieces and pose black the most problems. Um... I saw that this is extremely challenging for black, and I didn't think that my opponent would be up to the task. Just because there's a lot of stuff like bishop c1 to calculate. Um, but no, apparently black's okay if they just find the right moves. Just not so easy. Rook c7, this is what I was looking at when my opponent moved. Um, rather, I'd started to look at this on my turn. Realized it was too difficult for me to calculate, but then thought I didn't have anything better than rook a b5, so what the hell, we'll just play this and see where we go. Um, but, yeah, apparently this is not good enough for white. White center is indeed collapsing, and white faces a difficult endgame ahead. Um, no matter how you slice it. Uh, how I was slicing it was just that I was going to play f3 and allow black to capture. And I do take d4 either now or later. It doesn't much matter. And we have an endgame. And, you know, I think white's fine here because black's king is just kind of dicey. White has tons of compensation for his strange position. Um, but yeah, white can also seek more dynamic chances with like this. But I'm not such a believer in this endgame. I thought this would spook my opponent and that they wouldn't go for it. Um, but also I wanted to see what would happen if we did actually go for it. But I was too lazy at the time to calculate all the variations. Um, yeah, I think I stopped here and just said, you know, I'm not going to calculate all this stuff because this is just, there's no money on the line. There's no 
national master title or anything on like that on the line. This is just a local club game, league game, whatever. Um, so I just wanted to play it and see where it would go. Apparently it's not that great for white. Um, but that would have been an interesting game to play. Um, I guess the point of knight d3 is to free your g5 bishop um, to move about a bit more freely. Uh, I guess, yeah, why is this not such a concern? I don't know. I also figured, like, this would be more fun to post-mortem um, than to calculate during the game. Because it's just an enormous like tsunami of variations to look at, um, or kaleidoscope of variations or something. It's just much too much for us to look at during the game. I do like the idea of holding on to my C pawn, because that's my one pawn that offers some counterplay. Note, bishop f6 just drops too much material too quickly. Um, so, yeah, you do need... I think I would have opted for king e2 here. Um, but yeah, bishop f6 doesn't quite cut it. Can't black just take this? Uh, during the game I was convinced that taking an f6 in a lot of variations would just be a very pleasant thing for black. Because this f6 pawn is doubled, overextended, etc. I didn't think it would be a basis for any real counterplay. Even here I'm surprised that, um, like, surely taking f6 must be strong, right? What gives? h6 makes some sense because, um, well, black wants to play king g6 and then king takes pawn. Why not take there right away? I mean, well, yes, we'll trust the computer and make h6 the main variation, but how does this lose all of black's advantage? I was convinced that, like, this would be far better for black. Or not far better, but in other lines, bishop f6 is just a terrible idea. In this line, bishop f6 is an equally terrible idea. Um... But apparently black doesn't have the tempi to pull this off. That's nuts. How does g5 not win? How does g5 not win? Oh! This combination of pieces on the king side is too much. It's Okay, that's too much activity. So yeah, h6. Maybe this gives black the decisive tempi he needs to be able to take on f6. Um, so this is me all trying to refute bishop f6. It's actually too complicated to refute, so we're just going to leave that out. Um, bishop e3 makes some sense anyway, just like trying to hold this queen side together. I mean, it's an endgame. There's no need to go into all this stuff anyway. Um, so... Um, was there anything else? What else did we have here? Bishop g5. I was really proud of this. Um, Rook to e8 is black's best because... Was I correct here that Rook c8 just falls for... Yeah, you have to play Rook e8 here. Um, or Rook f8. Right. I was looking at Rook f8 during the game as well. Although, not so impressed by it. Um, because black wants to keep pressure on the e-file. So rook e8 is the cleaner move. It's the more typical Grunfeld move here. If black is to get counterplay, they do need to play rook e8 at some point. Is f3 the only way to pursue an advantage? I don't like g3. Uh, king f1 might be okay. I'm just surprised white doesn't have more active play in this position. But I guess white's kind of overextended, so f3 is necessary. Which in turn means that rook e8 is necessary to avoid 
well, you know, this stuff. So yeah, Rook E8 did get played during the game. Um, and I played this move because I thought it was fun looking. And it was a fun game, but I was not better in this position. So both... Well, no, during the game I thought I was not better. Um, I thought this was extremely complicated, and I refused to give it an evaluation. Um, other than if black makes one mistake, this is pretty easy for white to mop up. Um, was my assessment. Which is not the same as just giving this a number of minus 0.3 and such. Uh, I was proud of this rook a b5 because with my center collapsing, my king side falling, and I have no queen side past pawns that are going to promote or anything, um, playing a move which just allows everything to hang while you activate all your pieces, it's, it's a fun way to play blitz. And I carried over that same blitz spirit into this uh, slow game. Uh, that all said, we got into this position in the first place probably due to inaccuracies on my part. Rook c5 is something I was too proud of that I should not have been. Um, king e1 makes some sense here. Is that my best? Yeah, so king e1 is necessary, so is that to say rook b1 is not necessarily... Well, no, Stockfish is backpedaling here too and saying that rook b1 is probably best. Uh, so if rook b1's best, and if rook b1 leading to king e1 is best, then that's just to say that this rook c5 was just a total lemon. Um, yeah, rook hd1 should have been considered. I just thought this was too equal and boring. I didn't want to go for it. Well, no, not just was it equal and boring, but... White has a very difficult technical task ahead, and not so much fun counterplay to, um, to make up for all the challenge. Like, yeah, White can probably hold this, but White's always holding on to the worse end of the draw, as opposed to the position where all my rooks and everything was active, and a single slip from black could easily give White the advantage. There, only black can win. Um, so I didn't favor that. So rook c5 was terrible, or bad. Although it's not as bad as I'm making it out to be. Bishop d5, uh, in turn, does not give white an advantage. But I only played it because I didn't see anything better. Um, Enjoy kind of likes rook hd1 here. I was... I did look at this during the game. Although, because black has this option to play e5 at any time, I really didn't like this. Um, I thought surely black was better here. Um, I was thinking knight takes d4. And regardless how I recapture... Um, well, that's interesting. Why would you not play e5? e5 looks natural to me, but I guess it loses a pawn, so this is the better way to go. Um, so yeah, I saw a ghost during the game. I was thinking this is just winning, and it's not. Not at all. Um, for one thing, a king c3... Um, gives white the more active position. But, I guess more importantly, bishop d5? How's bishop d5 work here? What's the key idea there? It's that white sacrifices this pawn for initiative, and their king is safe. That's nuts. Um... Dang. Uh, yeah, no, white's definitely better here. And I get to keep my bishop on d5 in this variation. So, rook h to d1 would have been um, a way for white to preserve an advantage here. Wow. 
Uh, and does e5 just completely fail here? I should g5. Um, wait, why are we moving the rook off the d file? No, we're keeping the rook on the d file. Oh, okay. Well, it's one of valuable tempo. So why bishop g5 then? What's so great about bishop? Yeah, it's not that great. Stockfish is changing its mind. Just play d5 straight away. Okay. And, um... Hmm. Black is overextended. If he goes knight d4. Jeez, this is not pleasant for black at all. So, yeah, what that means is e5, d5 is just awesome. Not that I was, until just a minute ago, I wasn't seriously considering e5 there, but e5 in general does not win, because white's king is too active, as pieces trade off in this opening position, which becomes an endgame. So yeah, rook hd1 would have been the best way to resolve this, just keeping all the tension in the position. I was not ready for that. Um, but did I miss anything earlier? Have we hit the opening book positions yet? Rook to d8. Rook hd1 was played once with a draw. So that was a game between uh, Kromnik and Svidler. <laughs> Yeah, just following in the footsteps of giants here. Um, I played bishop d5, which deviates from all theory. But that's amazing that like my game would follow Kromnik for 13 moves. Like, wow. Okay. Did not expect that. I'll have to read more about... Um, the Grunfeld, in the rare chance that an opponent actually plays it against me, which seems kind of unwise, because um, like all of Black's chances, or most of them, will lie in exchanging off into an endgame, um, or in trying to win some kind of tactical melee. But we know that like I have extremely good luck in positions where everything's hanging. So, we just rely on luck to carry us through some of these times. Um, and obviously it worked this game, though it shouldn't have. Um, but yeah, skill would dictate king d2, they castle. I could even play knight f3 here, and it's okay. I didn't have to go bishop c4. How does knight f3 go? Knight c6 d5, rook d8, king e1. Yeah, this is the game my friend was referring to between Kromnik and Kasparov. Um, where it's just an end game. Let's take a look at it. Oh! Whoa! That's cool. Let's cite the game there. Nice! That is a really cool feature. Didn't know you could do that. We've all learned something today. Um, <laughs> Kromnik versus Kasparov in Astana 2001. Okay. I'm going to have to read about more of Kromnik playing this Grunfeld stuff as, uh, as white. Because it seems like something that could suit me. It really does. Um... Yeah, me. Huh. Okay. So we've got Kromnik Fabi, which preceded what here? Bishop takes? The game disappeared when I played King takes, so Bishop takes is the Kromnik Fabi game. But how. What's going on here? We'll cite that game, saying it's something we should look at at some point. Um, 
I guess d4 is temporarily okay because of this tactic here. What an imbalanced position. Um, so is this, this is also following Kromnik and all that. So uh, at what point do we cite the game? Presumably once we've got enough moves into it. Um, yeah, I don't know the theory, but it's just a thing to consider. Um, interesting. Well, chess is a rich and clever game with all these interesting variations. Bishop d5 departs from all known theory because no grandmaster would play it. Um, or rather, at least this opening book doesn't contain bishop d5. What if we go to Lee Chess? Has anybody ever played Bishop D5 here? Seven times it's been played. Okay, what if we, like, take out um, some of those? Okay, we're still in book. What if we take out Blitz games? This has actually been played in classical chess on Lee Chess. And White's never won it. Um... <laughs> Which makes sense, because if white were to try to win this... Wait, what? The only two moves that have been played on Lee Chess are d5 and bishop d5. Okay. What if we reintroduce blitz games? Um, then do we get the good moves? Okay. Uh, yes, we got some people playing a lot of people playing d5 because that's a typical uh, Grinfeld move it's just in this position I think that it hampers white's bishop a bit too much and gives black an easy target to strike at with e6 so I'm not such a fan of that but apparently score is okay bishop d5 is the move I played rook hd1 of course um, we saw was the key move, and this has been played nine times in Lee Chess. Oh, <laughs> including by our very own the Llama Lord. Check that out. Hmm. Proceeds knight takes d4. What did the Llama Lord play here? Be nice to see, like, what was the one move that he played. Uh, the one game which drew had king e1 in it. Um. Wait, did I actually observe this game live, I wonder? Maybe I did. King e1's not best. At least according to the silicon friend. Well, it's interesting that it's even playable. Because, like, white's lost his center. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Um, but yeah, if you take some time and look at this, in the Blitz game it's harder to do that. Um, white's not giving up d4. I was thinking that knight takes and then e5 was bad, but apparently, um, let's switch back to the master database, just because why not? Yeah, knight takes is the only master move. Bishop d5, not king c3. Interesting. I would expect king c3 here. No, uh, king c3, I guess, leaves this bishop and king too vulnerable on the c file. But is it best? No, not by a long shot. Yeah, bishop d5 is the safest way for white to proceed. Pawn takes, and bishop f4. Um, yeah, and this transposes into the position where I highlighted the f pawn. This is not easy to find in blitz. But again, white's bishop pair and space advantage do count for something. Is white actually down material here? Yeah, white's down a pawn, but having the far superior position. So that's interesting. Um, so how do we wrap this up? Other than saying the Grinfeld's hard, uh, the more you learn about the Grinfeld, the easier it becomes to play it in all of its respective variations. 
Um, but I'd do better in general if I watched, read about more master games. And not just read about them from a curiosity perspective, but tried to structure them together in some kind of uh, opening repertoire. But, I don't know. In one sense, it's it's frustrating to follow in the steps where uh, masters have proceeded so many times just because like so many people know all the theory so it's fun to play offbeat moves but it's not fun to lose <laughs> uh, so i need to figure out like what can i do for an opening repertoire which allows me to play new and creative ideas but also doesn't completely depart from known opening theory uh, I don't know. Maybe I just need to get better at the opening and middle game theory stuff. And just seriously book up like everybody else does. I dread doing that because it's... Like, chess is supposed to be a fun game of exploration. And I think, in that respect, um, Go is just starting to be a lot more appealing for me these days. Because I'm not having to worry about openings and memorization. Whereas to play like slow time control games um, and try to get an advantage out of the opening, um, you're just asking for too much in chess. To do such a thing in Go, it, it's okay at the amateur level because you don't have to memorize all that stuff. Um, yeah, when you do approach a professional level, you have to memorize more things in Go. Um, but at least for now, I'm under the illusion that uh, Go games aren't as memorization heavy as chess games are. If I had to guess. Or if you are trying to play a chess game and you don't want to memorize things, you have to play unambitiously. And that's not the case with Go. Go is just much more complex. Um, to the point where we're seeing Go strategies evolve. Um, anyway. Yeah, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for watching. It's been an interesting chess game here. I did win it, but maybe not deservedly so. We learned a lot during the post-mortem here. Although, chances are most of our opponents aren't going to play a Grunfeld, so things we learned aren't going to apply to other openings as far as we know it. But if we do get another Grunfeld, certainly bear in mind this Kromnik Kasparov game. And I need to take a look at more Kromnik games, I guess. And see, like, what it is that he plays, just in general. Because he played a number of interesting games. I just did not follow his career so closely. So yeah, thanks for watching. It's been fun. And we'll see you next time.